Before we begin, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Amazon Music for partnering with me on this episode of Chasing Creativity, but more on this later. Let's get right into today's episode. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Chasing Creativity. This is Kiran Manral. I'm chatting with Lakshmi Puri, who has been India's ambassador, who has been at the United Nations for over 15 years and who's also been a leader at UN Women most recently for seven years. This is all before she wrote her debut novel, Following the Sun, and we're going to be chatting about that. Welcome to Chasing Creativity, Lakshmi Ji. I'm so honored to have you here with me on the podcast. Entirely my honor and privilege and pleasure. Good to see you again. Likewise. And congratulations on the book. It's a wonderful book. I have not reached the end yet, but I've been fascinated. And I think, honestly, I've been rationing it out somehow subconsciously because I don't want it to end. I've been enjoying reading it so much. So it's been like today I'm going to read 50 pages. Today I'm going to read 100, so many pages. And uh, okay, let's delay the end for a bit. But I know this book has been a long time in the making. It has been years and years that you started it when you were an ambassador in Budapest. And uh, that was 20 years ago, two decades ago. But you are ageless and as glorious as always from the time I've been following you on Twitter for years and years. But uh, tell me, when you started this book, and it is a book that is so firmly set in the pre-independence era, and it has so many layers to it, and you were writing it from a space that was distant from home. How did the book come to you? And how was the genesis of this entire plot? So this following the sun was um, in its germ very much within me for many years, and if not decades. It is something that I wanted to do as a tribute to my parents, but also as a tribute to an era, to our independence movement, to the young people who were engaged in that independence movement. And also, uh, I wanted it as a way of my reliving the world that I vicariously lived all the time when my parents were alive and heard their stories. So it was, you know, all of that. And then, of course, as it happened, the story of my mother's journey of empowerment, her and her sisters, was something that I wanted to tell because as a, as a feminist, as a, a UN women leader and activist. Uh, uh, so all of that came together. But of course, that was when I actually started writing. But when I started writing, the immediate, immediate uh, kind of uh, trigger was this uh, treasure trove of 148 love letters that I chanced upon when we were clearing up our uh, previous uh, house and uh, moving to uh, Budapest. I was moving to Budapest. My husband was moving to London. So we were clearing up. And there we found this tin trunk with nearly, (laughs) you know, at that time it was, say, about uh, 75-year-old letters, very frail, uh, but still legible. Uh, handwritten, most of them, a few typewritten, and uh, most of them my father's letters to my mother and her very brief and very matter-of-fact letters uh, to him. So that was another trigger point. You know, it just shook me up and said, you have to write about uh, the love story. And here is ready material. Here is ready material. Uh, because there was so much in those letters, uh, so much of the socio-economic history of the times, how young people interacted with each other, their friendships, their rivalries, their emotions, their ideas about themselves, about society, about India, what was happening in the political sphere. 
So there was this ready-made material for me as well. So I started writing and then the rest is, uh, <laughs> and then I resumed in, in uh, uh, 2020 when I had come back after 18 years being in Geneva and New York, nine years each. Uh, I came back and then COVID hit in 2020. I was always telling myself, okay, now I have no excuse of being busy. I have no excuse for postponing this project. So, uh, and when then the COVID came, and that was, I think, the turning point uh, in my being able to really collect all those memories, to collect all the material that was spinning within me in terms of characters, plots, uh, locale, all of that. And then within one year, I was able to finish my novel. Uh, at that time, I think the first uh, cut was, uh, I think one of the reviewers talked about the author's cut. So the original draft was uh, 270,000 words and wow. uh, some, uh, yes, some 52 chapters, I believe. Uh, so then that was that. I see a very strong, of course, given your work and given your career at UN Women, I see this very strong feminist influence throughout the book, whether you it starts from, you know, the 13th century poetess, Mukta Bhai Zabhangs, that you take, then you take even the mother, for instance, she's a gentle woman who is uh, subsuming herself to the need for the male child. But in her own way, she's also very supportive of her daughters and their uh, lives and their needs and, you know, their... Uh, that they should grow wings. The protagonist themselves, Malti and her sister. Then you have uh, even the Mad Queen, who is such a strong character. So all your women characters are so fascinating. And I love the fact that each one comes with their own backstory. So tell me a bit about how you decided to develop these characters. So um, some characters were um, in their very rudimentary, I would say, way, familiar to me. They were familiar to me in terms of my uh, mother's mother, Ai, who has been de depicted there. I never met her because I was born to my mother when she was 45 and her mother died very young when she was in her 20s. So that part is true uh, of the story. So Ai's death and all of that. So and who she was, I had heard about her. But of course, the detailing, the characterization is, you know, something that I imagined. So there are many characters like that. Ma Saheb is a total invention. Many of the other characters are, Sarla is a total invention. You know, one had heard stories about people, you know, that my mother used to tell us that in so-and-so's friend's house, this is what happened. Or, you know, so those stories were whirling around somewhere and you catch threads of those and then you put together. And then, of course, they also come to you as epiphany, as you know very well as a writer, that many of these things you've never encountered in your life, but they just come to you uh, as epiphany. What if I take her here? And what if I mold her in this way? You know, the excitement of that, uh, the, the excitement of creating characters is uh, very much there. And yes, you are right. Um, both Ma Saheb, uh, Sarla, uh, these are amazing characters in their, both in their triumph and their tragedy. I may be mistaken, but I I'm sure I'm not. This is the only novel in Indian writing in English that is so focused in this era set in Maharashtra. And your detailing is exquisite. Of course, it is the background and it is the lived experience of all those who have come before you. But I'm sure there's immense amount of research that has gone into it. I mean, even the scene as innocuous as them getting off at Victoria Terminus and the the people they encounter and how they are traveling in that day and age and who's going by the Tonga and who's going by whatever. What was your research process like? You see, because I'm a student of history, 
I wanted to situate my stories against the backdrop, the grand backdrop of the freedom struggle, but also the coming of age of this generation of young people, Western educated, but still wanting to reclaim their heritage of uh, the civilizational heritage and the cultural heritage and the the literary heritage and contribute to that. So I had my characters play a part in some, some not major things, but at least some interaction or some kind of connection with major and minor events of uh, the freedom movement. And what what do I mean by that? So let us take, in in the in the first instance how did i think about and what research did i do on the play the patriot the patriotic play that they enacted in elphinstone college satyajit gulam mm-hmm. so i had met mama varirkar in my life i just want okay. to share that with you i had been a great admirer of his and his plays were both patriotic but also social reform he was very you know there is a very famous play of his called bhumi kanya sita for example where mm-hmm. he takes sita's side in this whole you know story of ram and sita and her having to uh, be put through to agni pariksha and then going back to you know becoming the bhumi kanya that she, it goes back to mother earth from where she came so I was a great admirer so I said let me look at his plays so I looked at some of his plays and I found Satyajit Gulam so I read the whole play I translated parts of uh, the play which I have uh, reproduced in in the book and that also was in a way a reflection of the socio cultural even economic because it talks about the hero is representing uh, landless labor and small farmers in in courts so he, you know you you get an idea of what were the issues for people at that time and so you use a play within the novel so you do research on that um and also how the um elite at that time the indian elite within the <laughs> british raj how did they feel conflicted as between uh, you know working with uh, the rulers the british rulers and representing or or supporting or um, in a way uplifting the the poor and and those who were disadvantaged so you know there were so many layers uh, in that play that uh, i i really loved so i brought that in so those are then the characters uh, also participate in uh, say the simon commission protest as it happens i my research indicated that yusuf merali was both in elphinstone college and the government college where malti and guru went to at the same time so that was her indivity and and so i said okay so then let's you know get them engaged and then that's what happened uh, they participate they you know the simon then i describe how the protest first they go to the docks and then there is uh, the protest and then they are lati charge and you know they feel very validated not just uh, as bystanders and witnesses to history but being part of history that is something that again i picked up and and based on the research we came upon that so and then there were um, you know when when i arranged for meetings between my characters and some of the historical figures like annie besan jido krishnamurthy of course i had to do research uh, about them were they in bombay at that time what were they doing yes yes that particular year because you know there is a very very specific timeline that i am following so i i looked up uh, whether jitu krishnamurthy was actually in india at that time 
because he was he had gone to he had had this uh, self realization uh, which i refer to he uh, ohio i think he was and then he came back so and that there was this tension between him and any basant which was palpable you know so i read all that and then put it into the story similarly the fact that any basant was instrumental in the opening of um, Mah- mahila mahavidyalaya she was very much part of the banaras hindu university project along with madan mohan malviya so this i did some research both on banaras hindu university and then again serendipity i discovered that she was she was in 1929 when my heroine malti is ready to give up law and go and teach in banaras she is there inaugurating mahila mahavidyalaya you know so these coincidences of history positive uh, coincidences of history happen and uh, so i said wow and then as i describe i describe an epiphany that malti has that she must that ani is calling her and that she must go to banaras so you know those those kind of links between what story you're trying to tell where you're taking your characters and the historical figures events and literature of the time personalities of the time the meeting between uh, her and mahatma gandhi i made sure that in that year mahatma gandhi was in lebanon road <laughs> staying at jahangir pethis guest house and he was going to be addressing the santa cruz gathering so you know some of these things so that it it is authentic and not completely made up you spoke about the book being to 70000 words when you started the first draft and you obviously you have cut it down quite a bit so what was the process like because you know killing your darlings is a difficult thing for any writer <laughs> and to kill such a big chunk of your work must have been quite a process so that is what actually took another one and a half years uh and i did it all by myself because i said i'm not going to allow any editor and and i must say david also left it to me to decide how i want to cut it what uh, you know david davidar uh, whom i would very much like to thank for giving me this opportunity and and discovering uh, me and and the worth of the novel he left it very much to me what i wanted to cut of course some places he pointed out maybe this could be done way way but overall i think i tried to then exercise as you said with a heavy heart <laughs> <laughs> the the excision process was painful but i also realized you see my uh, if i will just divert a little into my style a lot of it was dialogue this is one of those uh-huh. novels where there is a lot of dialogue almost like a play so the easiest way was to to reduce words was to cut the dialogues and convert a lot of them into description or you know show and tell but uh, i mean show show and tell both and also uh, it was about um, some episodes cutting down those episodes some characters i excised as well uh, but they could, i think in in retrospect we could do without that and uh, if and when and i hope it is not a question of if uh, when uh, we do have a web series um, hopefully we'll be able to use some of that material back uh, which is quite rich uh, i would say for uh, dramatization of the book so yes it was difficult to kill your darlings but i was told that this is part of being a, a novelist that you have to learn to both uh, create your characters be creator but also destroyer shiva <laughs> and and vishnu and brahma all together 
That's a wonderful, wonderful analogy. So I do hope you retain that author's cut with you for the dramatization and when it ha- does happen. And what was your process, right? Did you have like fixed hours? You sat at the desk every day and wrote because this was a lockdown when you did the bulk of your writing. So did that help in any way? It did. It did because after my exercise regime, which is very fixed and I'm obsessive about, I would uh, spend eight to 10 hours every day writing. I had a, on a, a nice uh, leather uh, couch <laughs> in the corner of my gym room. And I would sit there and work on, on that text. Sometimes I would change locale depending on the weather. I would sit outside. But yes, uh, it, ha- it was uh, like a dharma, you know, that I had to do a certain number of hours. Uh, sometimes I would, uh, you know, sometimes I would say, oh, but I'm not getting anywhere with this. So then I would leave for about half an hour and then come back to it. And then write nevertheless, and then, you know, cogitate about it and then come back. So I think that happens to all writers. And and then, of course, sometimes I would get up at night. Suddenly, some idea would come about some character or some twist in the plot. You know, how do I create some kind of mystery? You know, taking a cue from your genre. So... You know, suddenly some idea would come at two o'clock at night and then I would get up and then my husband would look for me. (laughs) Are you okay? And I'd be sitting in the gym room, you know, trying to uh, capture whether it was a dream or whether it's an idea. I didn't, I could not say. So I was transcribing that (laughs) idea, busy transcribing that. Yes. I call these vampire ideas, you know. They come to you in the middle of the night, but sometimes in the light of day, they don't work at all. (laughs) But they seem so wonderful Um, in the night that you're compelled to put it down. True. Absolutely. And and I am faithful to the vampires, I must say. I (laughs) always listen to them. I put them down. And whether I eventually kept it or not is another matter. But I did include them, elaborate upon them. uh, And then... You know, if I had second thoughts, too bad. <laughs> then I, I, you know, excised them. <laughs> what are you working on now? I'm working on basically taking this book forward and taking it to the people <laughs> and to the readers. You know, I, I realized that in the social media age, it is as important to communicate about the book as it is, uh, it is to write the book in the first place. So that's what I'm doing these days and looking forward to a series. I've already done a number of interviews, TV, uh, magazine, and uh, look forward to many more. And also part of, uh, my book is going to be uh, launched at the Jaipur Literature Festival on 4th uh, February at 1 p.m. So I hope all your viewers who will be attending the JLF will come for that event. And then um, I'm also participating in other literature festivals in Tiruvananthapuram, the Bhuvaneshwar. So all the other festivals as well after that. Uh, But my first launch is at JLF. And then, you know, there will be city launches that I will be doing, Delhi, Bombay, Pune, uh, all, all, all those cities, Bangalore. But you know, one thing you said, if I may just uh, also come back to, you said that it is very uniquely also uh, reflecting the cultural, Marathi cultural and literary renaissance and theater renaissance of the times. But it is a very pan-India novel. Uh, It begins in Ratnagiri. It covers a lot of Madhya Pradesh, Indore, what I call Vaishali and Guna, you know. So it's Madhya Pradesh, Bombay. Then it goes to Banaras. There are some six, seven chapters. Uh, I I really like the chapters on Banaras. Loved writing them and reading them. And then Simla, Simla chapters also. I I really like at the the cusp of uh, independence. 
uh, and then Delhi. So it's a very pan-India, you know, locale and and setting, uh, and in that sense, a pan-India novel with uh, a Maharashtrian flavor or heart, if you will. Absolutely. And this is the book, Swallowing the Sun. It's a lovely book. I exhort everyone to please read it. And uh, thank you so much, Lakshmi Ji, for your time. It has been wonderful talking to you. It has been wonderful reading this book. Look forward to reading your next now soon. Don't take so long on it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Chasing Creativity. I wanted to say thank you to Amazon Music once again for partnering with me on this episode of this podcast.